So welcome to the Brave, Bold, Brilliant podcast. Thank you. I am joined today by a very impressive guy. He's a friend of ours, but actually happens to be an incredibly successful businessman. He comes from very humble beginnings, actually. So I am going to big him up because he won't big himself up. So I'm going to do that a little bit, if I may. Um, So very humble beginnings, left school at 16 and started life really a proper job as as a welder for BP. Uh, Then started getting into travel, really. So football trips abroad, became an overseas rep for buddies way back when. 20s, 20s. 20s? Yes. Oh, shit. Right. It's okay, it's okay. No, hang on, I'm going to start again, right, we'll keep recording. Don't you think it's better you make a mistake, though? No. Okay. <laughs> Twenties. Right. Why did I say okay. buddies? I don't know Chris worked for buddies. Oh, for God's sake. Right, for the editors, I'm restarting <laughs> from now. Ignore the first bit. Right, so I'm going to go. So welcome to the Brave, Bold, Brilliant podcast. Um, I am joined today by a fabulous guest. He's a great friend of, of mine and is an incredibly successful businessman, but comes from very humble beginnings, started life um, in Swansea and actually first job as a welder for BP. Then kind of started, got interested in travel uh, and, you know, started doing football trips overseas and then became a, a, a rep for uh, 20s at the time, which is one of the youth market brands. And since then, you know, set up a incredibly successful uh, business travel house with one shop, uh, started in 92 and then subsequently sold that business to TUI in 1999. I don't want to steal all the thunder, but really grew that portfolio of travel agency businesses. He's since got multiple businesses in terms of property, hotels. He was the largest shareholder in Swansea City Football Club. Um, and actually was there during the time when Swansea City were in the fourth division and actually took them through to the Premiership division. So really impressive. He used to own Swansea Airport, which he subsequently sold. So I am delighted to welcome the wonderful Martin Morgan. Thank you. Thank you for for the invite. It's a bit nice. (laughs) Um, So Martin, uh, obviously you are a well-known character, but for those of people that don't know you, what would be brilliant if you could just talk us through your journey, sort of where life started for you, where you are now, and and kind of uh, a couple of the key things along the way. That would be great. Well, I'll probably start a little bit earlier than anyone else. (laughs) I was conceived in Aberystwyth. It's the only race I've ever won in my life, and there was millions of them. Um, I was then born in Dudley. Not many people know that because I think I was born in Swansea because my father was a teacher um, so my mother was a nurse so I lived there till I was four and then I moved back to Swansea which has really been my home all my all, all my life really so um, I went to school I was doing okay in school bit of an argument with my father like maybe many people do um, which I I still love to death today and he's still alive and he's still really well um, who wanted me to continue in school and go down an academic route. I detested an academic route. I had a big argument with him when I was about 13 about doing down acad- academic. And I um, then said, well, I can get my own money and do my own money and do my own things. So I got a job in the football, selling football programmes, which would pay me a penny a programme. I did negotiate up to two. I think it's still only three pence now, which is like 30 years later, or 40, <laughs> 40 years later. Um, and then started doing um, the, the bus trips. I worked on the market really first. And then I went as uh, I got a job in BP Baglan Bay, which is Port Talbot on the outskirts of Swansea. And um, I was there as a welder and I, uh, I trained as a pipe welder. So you had like a four year apprenticeship. I'd done that and then they got rid of me at the end. <laughs> um, I kept the other welder there. Not just because he was a much better welder than me, but I think he was more suited to it. And then um, I'd done various different things, um, just any way to make money. Uh, basically, football trips was one of the big things I'd done with the Swans at the time. Um, so I'd run the football trips, so that would bring me in some money. And then a little bit of contract welding, no work, a little bit of contract welding. And then I bumped into a guy called Chris Buzzitell in Burton's um, while I was in there. And he said, why didn't you become a holiday rep? And I was like, well, I, he said, well, you do buses. So I don't speak any languages. Tell him you speak Welsh. <laughs> and they'll think you're fluent in two languages. <laughs> so um, eventually I got the job. I went to the, I, well, I went through various interviews. I think it was 6,000 people applied for like um, 16 jobs or some, something like that it was, of which um, there, was, there was many P 
people, really. Colin Butts, who wrote his Harry on the Boat, who sadly died, was one of the ones in the interview with me. Uh, Bradley Walsh was um, one of the one of the reps at the same time as I was. There was another guy called Tim Slade, who um, then went on to set up uh, Fat Face. So, you know, the interview was like a 24-hour interview, which is quite amazing, really. Keep you awake for 24 hours, and it's, um, it's, it's, it's an amazing experience, and I think you know, for any top business, it's a great way of taking people through. Maybe give yourself a, a bit of confidence in that. Got a job as a holiday rep um, and saved some money. Had a good time. My father never understood why I wanted to give up welding. And I said, like, I'm 23 and single and seems like there's going to be a lot of women in these places. <laughs> so that was definitely one of the reasons. Then realised I could make um, a bit of money. Um, doing the trip, so um, and doing it, so I, you could, you couldn't really make money. You could save money because all your accommodation was paid for, all your food was paid for. You didn't really drink very much, so it was, it was it was reasonably easy to save. Done the first year, and then I wanted to work in the winter, so I went back. I bought a flat in Swansea. My mother argued with me, so I bought a flat in the marina. So it got me on the property ladder. I was determined to get on the property ladder. Uh, I bought a flat for twenty six thousand five hundred. Rented it out to the bank manager, which, you know, I think is completely against the law now. So you mean he rented it out to the bank manager. He was like, oh, I'll rent it out. So I rented it out. Um, I was away working then, and my mother then had picked the kitchen and picked the bathroom. So I had an avocado bathroom in this brand new flat. <laughs> and I had an old farmhouse kitchen in this city flat. And I was like, but mum, no, no, that's what you're having. Mum, it's my house, not yours. No, 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 these look lovely. I do not want an avocado bathroom, mum. Well, you've got an avocado bathroom, Martin. So, so that was like probably one of the only arguments me and my mother ever had. Um, and then, uh, and then, where was I? I'm, I'm, I'm there. So then I, they wouldn't give me a job in the winter. So I went back welding. So I was welding. I was able then. There was a bit more work around then after the recession. So with the Margaret Thatcher and the strike with the miners. So it was like I was right involved then and couldn't get any work and do this. So then I went um, away to, well, I, I worked all over South Wales, over the corridor really. I'd done 12 hour night shift for 16 weeks at one stage. So it was like 12 hours, seven days a week, 16 days. But which obviously meant that I was able to then save more money mm. and then buy another flat. So then I had two flats and I was renting out. Um, and then went and worked in Benidorm then. Then they asked me, um, could, I, um, could I ski? And I said, can I ski? Can I ski? So I said, oh, great, start my ski resort. And I get the ski resort. And they said, you can't ski. So I'm like, nearly can now. <laughs> so I managed to get the job um, on the ski resort so in Andorra, which was great. Um, you know, and you could make um, more money on a ski resort, really, than a, than a summer resort um, with different currencies and everything like that. So that was a great experience. And then I, I got offered a job then with Countdown then as well to do a discount guidebook, um, which meant I could travel. And I was probably just getting a little bit, a little bit like I'd done my three years. I'd done Tenerife, I'd done Grand Canary. Done. So I was getting a little bit like, well, what am I going to do next? And then in the last... Uh, Ten days, I met my future wife then um, in Andorra, and it was like, okay, right, I'm going to go, rather than going to be a rep, it's not going to work really it, to, to do this as a married or with a partner person. So I went and done Countdown and was lucky enough to travel and lucky enough to get her a job. So we travelled, um, I don't say the world, but we travelled on 12 Greek islands, eight Caribbean islands, Florida, California, um, you know, Northern Ireland, Southern Ireland. So we, we travelled quite a lot to Portugal, Spain, to mean the different places. So it gave me a very good, a very good knowledge of a lot of a lot of places. And because I worked there rather than on holidays, I had to go. So say I went to Tomalinos, mm -hmm. I had to go around twenty restaurants, twenty bars, go to the zoo, go to the market, go to and get all these things in the in this discount guidebook. So you you. You knew a place probably far better than most people who generally went on holidays. So it was the car, I could always get round and do all that. So uh, that was good. And then travelled and then it was like, right, what are we going to do? I had a great friend, um, Sean, and she was probably the best um, travel agent in Swansea. An attractive blonde lady who talks more than me. <laughs> she, is, she is the only one who talks more than me. Um, and she does talk a lot more than me. Um, 
and we decided to set up a travel agency. So it was um, basically, it was a guy called Richard Cole who was in there first of all, there was Sean, there was myself, um, and there was my my wife, um, Louisa. So we done it like that. And then, you know, the, the rest was history. Really, travel I started in what I would call Coronation Street. So it was like um, the very working class terraced houses of of the area I was brought up in, really. Um, my mother and father got divorced and it was, it was like two miles apart and this place was actually in the middle and everyone was going, it'll never work, it'll never work. And I'm saying, well, there's, there's chimney pots there and the people have got some spendable money, so I think they will travel. So then I started doing the flat upstairs and then they started coming in and of course it was like, my wife was, say, a little bit shyer and um, we got married like five days before we opened the shop, so we got married, which was like, you know, no, not five days, we got married about 18 days before we opened the shop. So then five days after my wedding, whenever I had my 30th birthday, so it's like, right, you know, I'd done up a couple of properties in the meantime, so I probably missed this bit out, but I'd done up a couple of properties in the meantime of doing this. Um, so it's between, say, 26, so I'd made good money doing, buying properties that everyone wanted me to turn into flats, and I turned them into large six bedroom, five bathroom houses with sea views or whatever. Mm. And everyone was going the other way, but I, I sort of switched the other way to do that. And then it was right, open a travel agency. I said like, well, let's see if I can get 10 commercial properties. Can I buy them for 25, 28 grand? And can I get 100 pound a week rent downstairs? And can I get 100 pound a week rent upstairs? And it was like, okay, if I do it for the single women market, that was probably, they paid the most, they paid about £92 a week. So it was like, okay, so I'd done the flats up and then it was like, right, to do this, do this. But then the travel really started to kick off, to really start to work, even though we made no money in the first year, we turned over a million pounds. But in travel at the time, you, you weren't allowed to sell holidays for four months. It's like quite an archaic, unbelievable belief, really. So I had to prove you could trade for four to six months. So you could only sell like Butlins, you could only sell UK holidays. So we became pretty much one of the biggest of Butlins. So I went around everywhere trying to get people to do the Butlins holidays. And then we were we were guaranteed then um, ABTA, which meant then we could sell holidays. So then we started selling holidays and, you know, it was like, right, well, how are we going to be different? It was like, well, everyone would chat at half past five and they'd chat half day on a Saturday. And I'm like, well, we're not chatting half day on a Saturday. We're staying open on a Saturday and, well, we'll open until 6.30. And then we opened at 6.30 and then it was like, well, we opened at 7.30 and then we opened at 8.30 and then it's like, well, maybe we could go on teletext as well now because we're 8.30. So um, <clears throat> there was a guy called Colin, I can't remember his surname, um, in Thompson's and he invited us to Vienna for the day. So we went to Vienna for the day on a day trip from Birmingham. I remember hounding him in the duty free in Birmingham airport and saying, come on, give us some money. He said, well, you need a unique story for why I'm going to give you money for Taltex. So I'll do a Welsh page. So I'll bring the Welsh back in again. <laughs> <coughs> so I'll do a Welsh page. So he said, okay, how much is that? So it's £200 a week. So then we done a Welsh page and then it started to work. It started to work. And, you know, at the same time we go in one shop, two shops, four shops, eight shops, 16 shops. And just, so I tend to try and buy the properties and do that. So the business was going, the business was making um, money, making some good money. It wasn't taking any money really out, just the minimum money to take it out. And, you know, travel was doing well. I started then, um, there was there was a few guys then from Sunworld, of which uh, Manny was there, Peter Long was there, Andrew Williams, is it, I think, was there, mm -hmm. and Steve Brass was there, and um, they invited me on a ski trip, and I was like, I don't know if I want to go on a ski trip, I don't know. So I went on the ski trip, and then, of course, you knew more people, and it was like, and then it was like, right, I'm in the clique now, really. I was in the gang then, and then it's like, can we get more commission and invite you to another dinner or whatever, and it was a bit more networking, and then I was like, I probably worked at that side of it, and like, you know, Steve Brass is still probably one of my best friends to, to today, do to, you to, to mean? And Miles Morgan come along, and Miles is still, you know, massive friends. Do you mean like that? He did actually go for the twenties interview, but didn't get it. But <laughs> that's, an, that's another story. <laughs> Miles, <laughs> right. if you're listening, <laughs> right. I'm going to send it to you, Miles. Right. So um, then we turn around and done travel, and then um, next thing, it was like the time where everyone wanted another travel agency. So we were like pretty much one of the biggest on Teletext. But what I decided to do on Teletext was. <coughs> Excuse me, I decided how I could be slightly different. So it was, we had all the different numbers coming in. So I bought 400 different telephone numbers, sent every advert I put out with a different number. So then when I do a pay, an advert in, say, the Daily Mail, 
they'd um, they'd say, "Do you want another ad? It's two hundred pound." I'd say, "Well, no, I only had four calls," and they go, "Well." How do you know that? So well, I give every number. Oh, you should do one number. I said, well, no. If I do one number, I won't know which adverts work. So no. So I'd done that so that I could regionalise the papers. Not many people at that time on Teletext were regionalising. So they went in. So they, turned, they tended to be London operations predominantly. There was Manchester flights, which wasn't, right? But they'd always think it's only London. But of course, if you live in Swansea, you only want to fly from Cardiff or Bristol. You maybe won't go. Yeah. If you live in Newcastle, you only maybe want to fly from there. If you live in East Anglia, you want to fly from Norwich. You want to fly from Bournemouth. So we got five or six people in the um, sourcing the products and then regionalised the papers. And then, of course, it became crazy then. And people were like, God, you are flying from Norwich. Yeah, yeah. So we'd done all the different regions by splitting it up. So that, that worked. Then we went on to cruise. Then we bought, like... We took the island breeze and the topaz off Thompson's because they couldn't, they couldn't sell it. So I went up to Manchester and said, OK, we'll buy the ships of you. And it was like £6 million. So at this stage, we'd made £1.5 million. I'm like, shit, what have I done? I've just bottled £6 million on this. So I get inside my mobile phone that's a bit like that in the car. And I'm like, Jamie, Jamie, get them on sale now. I think it's 399. We can sell them at 399 and make money. And then we get the commission. And then we hit the target. So... Luckily, we sold it. You know, if we'd have had, if we'd have had a big issue at the time with, say, Salmonella on one of the cruise ships, we would have struggled. You know, we would have yeah. massively struggled at this stage. Um, and then, basically, then Thompsons came in and wanted to buy us, and then um, <clears throat> Air Tours came in and wanted to buy us, and then Butlins even came in and wanted to buy us because we were big in Butlins. So Butlins were looking at um, diversifying and how else they were going to do it so they became quite a serious player in it really so in the end we went to Thompson and were able to sell the business for 40 million which was a massive amount of money didn't want to sell it um, it was 22 million down and an 18 million pound earn out but you had to then hit um, whatever was 7.3 million in three years so mm. luckily we hit the 7.3 million within two years so I was able to I'd hit the targets then, so I was able to, to leave the business. But, you know, it was then difficult going into a corporate world because I think it's lions and tigers. You're very different. Very, very different animal, very different beast. I think there were um, some people who maybe respected my difference of opinion. But there was probably quite a lot of people who um, were maybe a little bit jealous. This guy's got the money, he's got no education, you know. What can he do? He hasn't got a degree mm. in marketing. His marketing is a blackboard outside with 12 pence worth of chalk in every shop. And it's like, so, you know, that was a bit different. And then left um, there, bought Swansea Airport then. Um, at the same time, um, managed to get through all the air, ta air, air, you know, air traffic control, employ them people. Went up to Bristol Airport. They just changed their airport, took out their... Um, luggage racks and put them in for the weigh-in and everything like that, which Bristol Airport gave them to me, which was like very nice of them, and then done that. Then they allowed all our people to go and do the training in Bristol Airport for the security checks and all of this, so we've done all that. So we went through it and it was like, right, okay, we're going to do it. And then this gentleman called Roy Thomas set up Air Wales and um, Roy's like, he's a bit of an enigma really, but he, he, he wouldn't listen. You know, and as they say with an airline, you know, how do you make a million in the airline industry? You start with 100 million, you know, and then it's easy. It's the same in football clubs yeah. as well. Um, so Roy turned round and then we got flights, the first flight to Dublin. So then we got flights to London City. Um, so it was like a very proud moment. You know, you go on the inaugural flight to London City and it's, you get there and it's Swansea. You go to Dublin and it's New York, Swansea, you know, Washington. So it was like as the 22nd largest city, I always felt it needed an airport and it's you know the runway is 1478 so it's quite long but it's not the 1700 or 1800 but I, I was like quite adamant on this but my wife probably didn't want to spend as much money as me maybe rightly so maybe rightly so at the time Louisa didn't um, and then it was like right okay basically and then Roy said he'd take over the air airport so he took over the airport um, so it was like okay you know go because I think it's better for you to have the airport and spend that money on that so mm -hmm. but Unfortunately, it's got slightly worse since then. Right. Same time, we, I, there was the nicest building in the centre of Swansea, a grade two star listed building, which is very high on the grade instead. So I wanted to turn that into a boutique hotel. Again, everyone said it wouldn't work. 
20 bedroom hotel, turned on and done it. And then we had like Catherine Zeta Jones stayed there, Michael Douglas stayed there, lots of places. So, first year it lost money because I had a chef who thought that he was the most important thing in the world and that he had to do the finest champagne and every sources. And then he went. Um, and, and then we, we made money there for, well, we made money every year there for 19, 20 years. This year, obviously, you know, who, who's, who's to yeah. know where we are? And with, with the government help, we might, we might break even this year, but we, we, we'll know. It's, you know. it's been a very hard last few days because you're dropping the number of staff down to, to, to start from scratch again and hope and hope and hope that it, that, that it works. Um, so that was, that was a hotel. Uh, bought Travelers back in the meantime. Thompson said they didn't want it. So bought Travelers back with 100 people, I think maybe 20 shops, 22 shops. Um, so still have Travel House. So that's there. Um, that's a bit disjointed now, really. And it went into the football club, went into the football club. So it was like, look, 50,000 in. So we were bottom of League Two, just about to get relegated out of the league. Put the money in. I said, look, let's find, see if we can find 10 of us to put 50 grand in each. We could only find like five of us. One was a, a weird South African called Brian Katzen, who I didn't like, but that's later become like a really like, just brilliant guy. And uh, so we'd done the dream with one of my best friends, Hugh, who then I asked him to be the chairman. So he became a chairman because I said, you're going to be Mina, you're going to do that. And then we, we went on a dream of seven, eight years and went, you know, fourth the third, the second, the premiership, you know. Of course, at this time, it was really, that's old money, but it's like, you know, we went from League Two to League One to the championship to the premiership. It's, but, you know, if you, it's sort of four divisions, and then we won the cup, and, you know, I had the great time, and, you know, I remember speaking to Roberto Martinez and saying, you are going to be our manager. You are going to be our manager. And then, of course, you know, we had Brendan Rodgers became the manager. We had, you know, you know, a lot of people, and it's like, I remember being like, this football fan who dreamt about it, and I'm like, and I'm like, got Roberta Martinez and Brendan Rogers both in my phone book, who both had messaged me like, "Happy Christmas," and like two days later, they're playing Liverpool Everton in the, the derby, the biggest yeah. derby, and both managers have messaged me, and I'm like, God, I might have like made it a bit in football, really. <laughs> I, I might have just done that, and then like, <laughs> it's like I've obviously got, you know, a lot of people in football who are friends and like Gilfie Sigerson who's at Everton and probably the best looking well as any partner I've ever had said best looking man on the planet um <laughs> which he is but he is actually the nicest man so he rented my house out then off me for a, a year or so so do, do you mean they've become friends as well as a business football so then the rest of the guys wanted to sell it so we sold it on to the Americans um which, you know, it's very hard competing in the Premier League. You're competing with some of the richest billionaires in the world. And, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, you know, you need you need a billion, really, to be in the Premier League and compete, or certainly several hundreds of millions that you're prepared to do. Mm -hmm. So, um, I don't know if that's me, really. And then, wow. I don't know. Yeah, there's, on, Martin, there's so much, you know, what I love about you is the fact you just go, yeah, you know, I kind of, you know, I, I just bought the airport and, yeah, I just, you know, sold Travel House for, you know, it was 40 million and then I just bought it back. You know, you, you were incredibly humble oh. about everything you've achieved um, and, and almost... That's what I think is charming about you, right? Because you are, you are, you do underplay, I think, how successful you've been in business. And it's very inspiring for someone that started out, you know, from very humble beginnings, as you said, to, to be where you are now with multiple businesses and, and everything that you've done. But you know that you have this natural entrepreneurial spirit, I think, from what you've described. You, you probably see things differently to other people. Where do you think that comes from, that, that sort of eye? I don't know. I don't know if it's... I don't, you know, like the word entrepreneur, everyone says that. I, I, I think it was like maybe a fear of failure, that you had no money. And it's like, if this travel loss doesn't work, I ain't got enough money. Yeah. I can't go to my mum or dad. My mum would have probably lent me £800, but that would have been, she'd have £800, that would be it. Do you know what I mean? So no one, so it's a fear of failure, really, and a fear of wanting to make success, trying to work out, you know, the businesses you go into, and they do not understand I would always use my adage of my cigarette packet numbers are this. And they would drive everyone crazy because it was like I didn't have O-level maths. But I'd say, well, you're going to need to take £4,200 roughly a day. And they go, no, no, you're wrong. And then they do it and they go like, 
yeah, you're about right, really. It's actually 4,281. And I go, well, look, that's what we need. And it's like, and you know, I, I know it used to drive all the accounts. And they, oh, we can't do them numbers. I'm going like, well, you need to work out. It's like when people do a balance sheet. I'm like, why don't you put pounds on there? Why don't you put pound signs? So when people say, oh, yeah, it's just uh, minus 661. And we're going, no, it's minus 661,000 pounds. You've lost 12,000 pounds a week. 12 yeah. grand a week. Yeah. All right? Something's not going right, boys, really, is it? No, no, we don't look at it like that because it's all spread over. Well, how are we going to look at it then? Yeah. You know, let's get the different profit centres in the different pieces. And then if we add them up, we keep, them, we keep the fat for period 13. And when we have some crap, we... Period 13, hopefully, has got some good to, to mm. outweigh the crap. Mm. Obviously, if you have things like COVID-19 or you have uh, an ash cloud, if you're in travel, it's 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 different world. And, you you know, no one can really do for that. But you try and get yourself safe in a good place so you can sort it out as quick as you can, really. Mm. Mm. And and I guess I guess something else that strikes me is just how passionate you are about sort of the, lo you know, Swansea, the surrounding areas. You know, you've done a huge amount locally for employment and, and kind of regeneration of the area, the air port you know morgan Ho morgan's hotel that you know you you kind of took from a yes it was a it was a beautiful listed building but essentially what it was, it was yeah, derelict, yeah, it was derelict, wasn't it and you kind of brought that back to life created jobs local economy how, how important is sort of being having an impact locally been for you with swansea i think it's i think it's it has been important, but I think it's like, you know, like we've got, do you mean my biggest business now is an actual industrial estate, right? I, you know, I know you're saying like, well, it's like I'm driven out. I run a manufacturing business for nine years in yes. the middle of this doing plastic extrusion from my father-in-law's business, right? So it's like, I have been very, very diverse in my different mm. things. The industrial estate I love, it's an area half a mile from where I was brought up. It was a very ugly industrial estate from a commercial point of view, you know, I've put glass fronts on it I put new roofs on it and it, it doubles my rent so it's it's been a a, a good commercial business in venture and I've loved that and then you know there is a a big-headed feeling or whatever you call it of people going like of going wow Martin the estate looks lovely so nice now it's so nice and it's like it does give you a feeling like the pride of when people go to Morgan's, wow, the building's good. And it, yeah. it was derelict for 10 years. You know, we employed 205 people. When I'd done Morgan's up, it cost three million. And I said, when I done, it was me and my wife done Morgan's up. It, it cost um, three million to do up, of which we spent 2.2 .2 million locally. Things mm. like carpets and air conditioning, we couldn't buy locally because there was, there was nobody else to do it. But all the other products, all the other labor, all the other materials became became local and mm. it was I you know I think as a Swansea's quite a deprived industrial city yeah and, and there are many in the UK mm. and you know I I love the city I love the city with a you know with a with a with a passion yeah and the football club I guess again that that was you know struggling needed the help and the support and you got 10 investors together you said you all put we wanted in. 10 but you ended up with six or seven but right. it was like me and Brian put the money in and then everyone else was maybe a bit slower putting the money in we allowed yeah. the trust to put money in and I think probably the trust hasn't actually helped the club massively everyone would disagree with me on that not everyone but it's like you're dealing with a committee then, really. It's very hard to make a decision, whereas Hugh run the, run the job fantastically well. And he, um, he, just, he was just very good at running it. Mm, yeah. so, so he was the, the right, mean, hard, poker place player. You know, because he had to go from like, you know, I remember the first player we brought in, Leon Britton, £800. And I'm like, well, he better be bloody. He'll have to work in the turnstiles first and cut the grass <laughs> on a Sunday. And then, you know, then 10 years later, we're paying people £80,000 a week, you know. Yes. And it's like, do, do, do you mean... But it takes some adjusting to get used to yeah. that as well. Yeah, yeah. You know, it does. It's like, you know, same in travel, I suppose. You, you get used to paying, you know, the YTS is £26 it was a week then. And then we got to take on a girl called Angela and she was on £200 a week. And it was like... Wow, and I said, well, I don't know if this is going to work. But then, of course, she brings in more business to do that. And, mm. you know, she brings in more money than the others would bring in anyway. So she's put, sort of paying for herself. But it's, you know, it's... Yeah. And good. You know those early days when you were overseas, I mean, you talked about a really competitive 24 hours of the recruitment uh, to, yeah. to, get, to get the reps job. And, and those, those days when you were sort of overseas and, and, you know, you were selling the trips and doing all of that, do you think that was a, a big... Um, helpful aspect of the experience that you that has that has sort of stood stayed with you since. 
coming back and actually being really focused on business. Yeah, I think maybe, maybe going to the market at 13, you learn a lot in the market at 13. Yeah. You know, you'd start to realise like very quickly, you know, if you had a, you're selling a coat and I'm selling a coat for five pound, well, if they just said, I'll have it, I'd charge them six pound. Mm. So you very quickly went, well, and if they'd say that, oh, I thought it was five pound. Oh, oh yeah, sorry, sorry, yeah, they are five pound now. They were six pound last week. And you do that. But then very quickly you'd go, God, I just made another seven pound by doing this or whatever. And it, oh, I suppose it's maybe a bit illegal, but that's market life is a bit like mm. that. To, to, mm. to, two minutes and then watching that people wouldn't steal off you and pinch and then you'd always have a few people doing this and then you'd have to try and be sharp and then sitting out there in the pouring cold you know and inevitably when I worked on the markets in the end I'd actually run a football trip like I remember coming back from hell once somebody's gone to hell and we drew two all at hell and it was like after being two nil down with 12 minutes to go right <laughs> and they missed a penalty right so that's another little sad autistic sort of <laughs> life of remembering all this detail <laughs> and then getting back in at two and then I'm off to the market at like 10 to 6 in the morning, do, do, do you mean? But it was me, yeah. so I've been lucky enough probably at not needing the, as much sleep as, say, some people, and being able to do that and have the hunger and the ambition to, I don't know, probably try and do as good as you can with your life and try and live every day of your life. You know, I have a business life, but I want to have a um, an enjoyment out of life. Mm. Like I'll crave mm. to go and try and see four new countries every year. Do, do you mean I... So it's, there's very different aspect. I crave now to be the best father in the world as well. Do, do, mm. do you mean I just, I'll crave to be the best husband in the world or whatever, even though I probably haven't been at all. Uh, do, do you mean it's like that would be, it's just me, I guess, the way I am. Yeah, it's almost, it, some of it, it seems to be almost, if it's worth doing, if a job's worth doing, do it to your absolute maximum potential in, in, in whatever it is you, you've got involved in. You've always sort of reached for the, the, the optimum that you could possibly do and never yeah. just accepted mediocrity. And I think never, yeah. ever with an intention of selling out. Right. I've always tried to do it, that I will keep that forever. Yeah. And okay, travel knocked the door and the football club knocked the door when my I wouldn't have sold the football club, but my other partners it was gonna re- release you know, they were very working class guys mm. and it was gonna make them millionaires, say for, yeah. for doing that. So it was I couldn't really I couldn't really stop. I'm like, oh people could go, Oh, you could go to the bank and borrow the money and you could have bought them out and it's like but it's I am you know, I've been lucky enough I used the bank in very early days, but I I've tended to be unencumbered and not use the banks, which lots of people say, well, you should use the banks, you should mm, use the banks. Mm. But me personally, I, I I, think any different idea I'd give them, they don't probably like. They'd say, look, this doesn't work, this doesn't work, this doesn't work. And I've gone, well, okay, I'll do it myself then. Do you think that might come from, you, you mentioned earlier about sort of a position of scarcity almost, you know, from not having money and not coming from a money background. Do you think the, the approach to sort of debt in your mind is influenced by those early years yeah probably maybe. I think like my, my 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 parents really were what they would call West Walians which it'd be they'd call them cardigans cardigan from this area and it's classed as the tight farming community area right. and not to really borrow money it, it and I know that's generalizing and it's doing that and it's like <laughs> like you could call you know I, I think in Britain it's often called the Scots mean but it's and it's but yeah, I was brought up with that. You know, I was brought up, my father giving me a pound a week pocket money. Mm. And that's all I had. Well, that was it. Uh, if I wanted two pence more, I would not have two pence more. Mm. To, to, to me, and it was, so you, you got to manage with the amount of money you had. You know, yep. pound a week, I probably, I probably had slightly more pocket money than, say, some of the people. But they could always ask for more money, whereas I could never. Yeah. You know, and I'd have my pound pocket money on a Friday or whatever. So, you know, if we're going on holidays, I'd have to save my pocket money. Okay, your aunties, and then we'd give you, you know, a pound to go on holidays or, or whatever it was yeah. at this time. Yeah. They'd give you a bit of money, but I have to, you know, my, my father would then always be, well, you should be saving a bit from holidays. You don't really want to be spending a pound now. You know, you want to spend 80 pence, you've got 20 pence to go on holidays or, or, or whatever. It yeah, would, yeah. Whatever it would be. Yeah, you? it's almost that attitude, I guess, investing, you know, investing in, in you know, use your money wisely. Um, yeah, and I, I think people are like, you know, there's a use, the young seem to very, they seem to want to make money very quickly. Mm. They want to make it all in a year, all in two years. And I think it's, you know, it's gradual, gradual. It's like a turn around and say to people, well, you know, I have a little bit of a belief, like, is it, is the first thousand pounds the hardest? 
because if you've got no money, you've got no job. That first thousand pounds is almost impossible. Mm. So if you have a thousand pounds, okay, well, how can I get it to ten thousand, and ten thousand to a hundred thousand, and then a hundred thousand to a million, and then a million to ten million, and mm. go well, okay, and a lot of people will get to ten million and stop. But I don't know theoretically if they're that much harder. But it's it's the step of right. what it is. Because if you haven't got a job, you can't get to a thousand pounds. And then if you've got a job, maybe you can save a little bit and go okay to. But they seem to want that money straight away rather than doing that mm. deposit. I was lucky with property went up at the time, but but I was lucky that I probably went into a different sector where generally property went down, but I went into converting something that not many people were doing. Mm. So I hit the market right. I sold both properties within two, three days and going to market. The first one was the most expensive terraced house in Swansea at the time, and the second one was the most expensive semi-detached house in Swansea at the time. Do, do, do you know what I mean? So mm. I did do something different. I, you know, remember buying like, you know, five sheets of Zoffany wallpaper because we thought we could work it out. But then the angle, and it was like we had one little tiny piece to come in, but we wouldn't pay the £18 for the other roll of Zoffany. So we cut the little piece in and then we'd try and learn then how would you join it when it's there or not there like that. And you join it by ripping it rather than cutting it or whatever. And it was just, just all the different bits because you had no money. I, I worked on the building site for a year with, with a, you know, what me and my wife did. We worked on, we worked doing the house up for the day. So we learned for years. So we learned how to do the plasterboard, how to do everything. Mm. So it's give you a knowledge now. Where, and, you know, I will regularly going to work three days a week and I will work in scruffy clothes on the building site, helping the boys do plasterboard or paint. And everyone goes, something wrong with you, something wrong. But it's, I don't know, it's what makes me happy, I suppose. Well, yeah, and I know, I mean, that work ethic is, is phenomenal. I mean, no one could, could ever fault your, your, the hard work and the hours and the graft and, that you've personally put into building your businesses. But when you go to, I know, and I, I would say to any very young person coming through now, when you go in to do something you love, it's not work. Mm. It's not work. It's, I, I get out of bed. And I, I'm like, I cannot wait to get in there. So, because I wake up a bit earlier, I go on the bike then. Just give me something to do. Mm. And I get back on the bike, well, like 20 minutes to go, shower change, and I'm gone. And it's like, so I get to work, you know, when the boys start at eight o'clock on the building site, and I'm there. And they're like, you know, oh, I just got up now. Well, you were out late last night. I'm like, yeah, well, I've just done 10 miles on the bike or whatever yeah. as well. But it's <laughs> just me being that wanting to live every minute and be busy all the time. Yeah. I'm yeah. probably not liking myself otherwise. <laughs> not, like being, not like being anywhere near myself because I get bored with myself. <laughs> but you also touched, I talk about being bored with yourself. You touched on about um, mixing with the right people as well. And that, you know, you got, you got in with the Peter Longs of this world, you know, and you thought, oh, actually, yeah, this is, this is kind of a good group of people to be in with. Yeah, well, Peter, you know, Peter was... Peter probably wouldn't even know who I am, right, at all, right? But it's like, um, you know, but he was in that group and it was, you know, and Peter was probably the most successful man in in, in travel in the corporate world, without a doubt, without yes. a doubt. Yeah. If you, you know, if you turn around and say, okay, you know, there'd be, um, you know, there'd be some other people there who, who have been, but, you know, Peter understood the business. Mm probably better than anyone else from a corporate world I would say mm. yes there's other successful people who come through travel on an entrepreneurial flair yeah. Peter was destined to to be the corporate world I'd say and maybe yeah. maybe maybe he'd disagree with that whereas you know there was you know like I'd say that Miles Morgan and Steve Barras are like you know I just they're like my best friends really yeah I mean? and, and Simon Maud is an, another one who's you know you could turn around and talk about you know and then Brian Katz and the, the South African who's there like that is is there. So it's, um, you know, it's... Yeah. How important has that been then, Martin, to be able to have the right people there to bounce ideas off or get inspiration? Or, or have you always been sort of quite much a, a self-starter? And you know, Yeah, you... I'm probably a self-starter. I probably listen to myself more. You know, yeah. uh, I will ask people's opinion. I generally make my own opinion. If I ask people's opinion, I'm probably split off for you. I don't ask the opinion. Do, right. do, 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 do you mean I just like it's somewhere where I you know I generally go well that's what we're doing so you've got a real confidence and self-belief in in what you're doing yourself you don't necessarily need lots of reassurance from other people you you'll see an idea and you'll you'll kind of think it through and then and then go for it is that is that yeah a, yeah yeah I suppose so yeah yeah 
And, and when you when you got involved with the cruise ships, you made me laugh before when you said, oh, yeah, we've just gone and bought the cruise ships. It's six million. Yeah, we quid. didn't have the six million. So <laughs> Thompson's, we only had to pay on departure. Or, or we had to pay like two weeks before departure or whatever yeah, it was. Yeah. You know, and I'm like, OK, we've done it now. We're going to go for it now. <laughs> and I guess that comes back to what you mentioned earlier about almost like the fear of failure. So I can't fail. So we've just we've done it now. So we've got to make it work. Yeah. But obviously, if there'd been a salmonella <laughs> outbreak on one of them ships at the same time, well, I, I would have probably gone back to Thompson's and gone mental and said, look, yeah. you know, what are we going to do, guys? You know, you've got this. But I didn't have no contract written. I didn't have anything done like that. But, you know, when you'd, you'd you know, you'd have hoped there'd have been a fairness, but there might well not have been a fairness. There might well have yeah. been, fine, you you're gone, you're Tough. gone, yeah. that's, that, that's you. Whereas you'd have a contract and say, look, I'll take the ship, but if there's COVID-19, if there's an earthquake, if there's a, mm. you know, an outbreak on the ship, we'll have to give it back to you. Mm, mm, mm. But I didn't do that because I would have cost me money, cost me time. It was like, right, okay, we're doing it, we sold it. And it's like, I remember driving back from Manchester, and it's like, okay, yeah, we, you know, by the time they got it up on, they got it online, and then it's like, we sold eight. And I'm like, well, stay open, stay open. <laughs> and it's like, getting in there the following day, then it's seven. And it's like, right, okay, phones are starting to ring. And right, yeah, we sold, oh, we sold 34 today. And I'm like, right, okay, yeah, we only need to sell like, you know, 12 a day, maybe we can put the price up and then doing the yield management on it then to see if we could get a bit more price. We want yeah. to get some gone. And then, of course, you have the empty legs. You have the empty legs and the different weeks that are there then. So Yeah. And ha so and you've done a huge amount of property, haven't you, as well? Residential, commercial. Obviously, you've got the industrial estate. How, how important has been, because you've got your trading businesses, clearly, you know, that with Travel House. Yeah, and, then and you've got Travel Hotel and Football, say. Yeah. And and normally, you're... still 5% of the football. Right, right. But, but, but you've got the assets in the property. So how, yeah. how in, and, and you did that very young, actually, you know, you said I bought my first house and I was in, you were in your 20s. Yeah, probably uh, 22, 23, I guess. So which, yeah. you know, was incredible. Yeah, and then I had two at, I had two with a year later, really, and then, you know, three. But I rented the other, I rented the two out. It was a mm. bank manager and it was the other bank manager, as mad as it was. <clears throat> and then I managed to rent them out to the footballers then. So then I had the footballers in there for quite a long time then. So that was... That was quite good. And then, the, so the property portfolio you've got now, it's a combination, what, 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 how, what's, what's the kind of shape of it? What does it look like? Is it mainly on the commercial side or? Um, yeah, I'd say it's predominantly commercial. Obviously, I've got my two, I've got my residence in Swansea. Mm. I've got my residence here. Um, and then it's predominantly, like, you know, there's a large amount of travel agencies because we've got 22, 23 travel agencies. Um, so I think, like, maybe 15 of them are owned, 14, maybe 15 mm. are owned, um, either in a pension fund or myself. And then you've got industrial estate, then you've got all the hotel bits and bobs. And mm. so more commercial, really. I've gone down more down commercial. Yeah. Even though I started in residential, I felt everyone went into residential. But, you know, with commercial, who knows now where the high street's going yeah you know nobody knows but you know you, you have got an amount of bricks and mortar and you have got a thing and you know i'm predominantly the you know the um less affluent suburbs mm. of mm. uh you know which which you know they've nearly all got a nail salon they've nearly all got a hairdresser they've nearly all got a tattoo parlor now mm. so you know okay they work with a travel agency and who knows where the travel will go but there's you know there's you know there'll probably be some use for them after if it's not travel. Hopefully it's travel. Yeah. Hopefully it's travel. And we might have a horrendous six-month storm to get through. And yeah. if everything's there, you know, hopefully. But, but you know, we'll have to adjust as, as that is, really. Mm. And, and with, your, with your businesses then, because you, you've got quite a diversified portfolio, essentially. So was that a conscious decision to say, OK, we need to, I need to create multiple streams of income so that I have got, you know, I balance my risk? Or was it just something that naturally uh, evolved as you got into different things? Yeah, I think I probably, a mixture of both really. I think mm. I get, I can see an opportunity or whatever. And I think, well, I'm mad not to do that opportunity. And then it's like, you know, you know, you run the travel agency. Well, why are you going to pay £10,000 a year rent when you can buy it for 80000 mm. So you're going to buy the property then, haven't you? You know, it's like a 12% return on your money. Well, you'd be mad not to buy the property. And then it can be like, then there's spin-offs off that or whatever it is and, mm. you know. Yeah. So it's like. Yeah. And, and just in terms of kind of if you were giving advice, business advice or life advice, actually, to, to someone that's sort of either at an early stage of their career or that they're starting a business or looking to scale up a business. What sort of advice would you give them having all those years that you've sort of been in business? I just think you've got to you've got to be careful with the bank. I would. 
and other people say very different, mm. but do something that makes you get out of bed and you do not feel like you're going to work, something mm. you love. Mm. And if you love doing it, so if you're a fitness instructor, most of them absolutely love what they do. It's the best job in the world and they love it. And lots of chefs, they absolutely love what they do doing. And you know, there'd be loads of different sectors mm. like that. You know, I'm not being funny. You look at lots of the people during this, you know, this, you know, pandemic we've had now, the nurses and the doctors, they love going to work. Very easy for them to say, oh, I'm not going to work, I'm not very well. They loved going to work. They, yeah. they, you know, and there are people, and I just think when you love going to work, it's very easy. And I, you know, I've always tried to make work that's quite a happy place to turn around and do it. I've always tried to, you know, say when we had 20 travel agencies and you'd take all the girls away. Um, on a conference, but I would generally take all the husbands away as well, because mm. then there wasn't any conflict, and then the husbands would get to know you and go, "Oh wow, this is this is pretty good." Yeah, yeah, no, hundred, and, and then you're right. I think merge your passion with your profession, and then you never feel like you work a day in your life. And you're always going to have good days and bad days because that's just life, isn't it? But I think if you can find that magic place where you just genuinely but, love something, but then everyone's got to try and find their magic place. Yeah, yeah, and if you find your magic place. It's, it's, I think it's easier yeah. to succeed. But I think too many people do a job that they get stuck in a rut at. And I think, you know, if, I'd have, if I wasn't laid off from BP, would I have left that job now, which is, say, you know, probably 35,000 a year now? Mm. I think I would have left. But you never know because you've gone, oh, one more year, then I got my mortgage, or oh, another one, and you're always oh, kids coming now. Oh, we're never going to do that. Yeah. And to give up that salary because I didn't have a job, you, you, you go, well, right, okay, I've got to make my own money. Yeah, sometimes it's easier, isn't it, to make a change when you've almost got a bit of a burning platform and, you, yeah. you know, because you, you've got nothing to lose, you may as well make a go, give it a go and make a go of it. Whereas if you're OK or slightly comfortable, sometimes it's harder to make a change, isn't it? Because Yeah, you, and the you, amount of people that say they want to make a change and they want to turn around and do that, yeah. but they don't actually ever do it. And then they, you know, maybe regret it. I, in my life, I do not regret I do not regret many, <coughs> many things at all in my life. I, yeah. I, don't, I don't think I've wasted much time in my life. You know, there's bits where I probably am, but in hindsight, it's probably not that, not that amount of time I've wasted, really. No, and I mean, you, you cram a lot in, you've crammed a lot in, let's face it, with everything, all the things you've talked about, there's like so much yeah. in there. You know, you don't waste time, do you? Time is precious, you make the most of every, every yeah, opportunity. Yeah, I do, yeah, and I think the mobile phone helps a lot. You get the car and you, you could go in there. So, you know, the manufacturing business, I, you know, I went there for, two days a week for eight years. Do you mean it was losing a million? It ended up making five million, doing fire sales, doing collars, doing point of sale, mm. largest rubber extruder. But I would be on the phone for like the second I walked out of the factory for two and a half hours on the way back and the second I left the house for two and a half hours. Yeah. So I'd be working on the, on the phone, doing, and not, not just working, you know, you'd mix working up with like, oh, how are you and how yeah. are they doing? Yeah. Or hi, dad. Oh, I'm sorry, I won't be able to get there today. But I have, how are you keeping? Are you well? Or, you know, whatever would be the mm, balance. Mm, but it mm. was, you know, I would try not to lose that time. And then also to try and enjoy to travel and to see different places and to, you know, probably love going to a different restaurant. You know, if I went to, you know, Palmer say for a week I'd try and go to two different new restaurants mm. you know just but that would be me because I think you'd learn a bit more than always doing the same thing yeah no it's fantastic so what's next for you then Martin I don't know what's next I think obviously we've got a um you know we've got difficult a difficult situation at the moment with um with the world of the pandemic mm. so we've got to see see where that goes hopefully travel can survive hopefully um you know the hotel can survive you know, the industrial state is doing uh, very well during this. You know, we've got some good tenants and they've all seemed to be really busy. So that's that's positive. But I think at the moment I'd be like pausing and just going, OK, look, look let's just let's just see what's happening. Let's just see mm. what's happening. Let's just see how how long we could be in a, a downward spiral. Mm. You know, how long it is, I think, you know. But but so I, I think it's a it's a bit of a pause, really. Yeah. And it's a bit of a pause in your life really as well of like well right well which way am I going to go yeah. which direction am I going to go but you know there'd be you know I think I'd certainly have one or two more major things I'd like to achieve on a tick I think I've been lucky enough to you know do say five dreams and I've probably done five of them and I think I I'd like to think I could do two more dreams say 
yeah. of, of whatever it is. But, but what they are at the moment, I don't really know. And I think that's important, though, isn't it, to take stock sometimes. You said, let's pause for a bit. You know, one, let's yeah. see what's going to happen economically in the world, because clearly, you know, there's a lot still to play out, isn't there? But just stop in for yourself, because I think sometimes we're, if you're, if you're, um, if you've got a busy mind and you're always looking at opportunities as they come up, you know, you, you can be going at such a pace, can't you, that you ne you rarely stop and, and, and just give yourself headspace to think. Yeah, I think at this next. moment in time, I think, but we've almost all had to do that yeah. for the last four months or yeah. whatever the period is. Yeah. We've almost all had to do that. And I think there's probably a lot of people are um, refocusing their life mm -hmm. one way or other. Yeah. Maybe refocusing their partner, maybe refocusing their business. Maybe turn around and say, well, look, I'm 63. I don't want to actually work again. Or yeah. I'm, I don't need to work again. Or I'm not going to live in London. I'm going to move down to the countryside and enjoy my garden and do my life. And other people go, wow, I hated it in the country. I want to get into the city. Mm. But I think there's been a lot of... <clears throat> A lot of people refocusing, you know, what's maybe important to them in their life. Mm, mm. Yeah, hundred percent. And I think that's a bit that's a that's a really good advice as well. Because if you if you never stop, just for a second, <laughs> sometimes you know you you don't give yourself the headspace to sort of almost clear the decks a little bit. I'm yeah, I, I think yeah, I think sometimes you know you it's, it's like the old adage: you often don't realise what you've got until it's gone yeah and it's like well at the moment we do have an amount of time you know which is is we're all on clock with mm. the time ticks mm. and and you enjoy it you know i'm 57 i go if i was lucky enough to live till 87 i got 10,000 days left so let's not waste many of them days I love that. 10,000 days left. That's so oh. specific. Oh. <laughs> 10,000 days. I've left. said that since I'm 50. That's the only problem. <laughs> I, keep, I, keep, I, can't, I can't get me low the 10,000. <laughs> You're going to be over 100. Yeah, <laughs> yeah 10,000 days left. <laughs> excellent, excellent. So just two final questions, if I may, Martin. Uh, best piece of advice you've ever been given? Oh, that's a hard question. The best piece of advice I've been given? Um... I think for people starting off in business, I think it would be focus. I think stick to one thing, stick to what you're doing well and do that. I haven't listened to it, right? But I, I did when I first started travel. I did mm. when I first started travel. When Hugh ran the football, he was focused. It was one thing. He sold his business, which he was focused. Mm. So I think actually being focused on the one goal you want to do is, is the one. I think then if you become a bit more um, do other things because there's rubber opting. But I think your first one, do what you want to do and focus mm. on that one thing and as Steve Barras would say you know I'm not smarter I'm not brighter I just work harder mm. I'm in work every day at 7 30 and I'm still there at 8 30 at night and you know that makes me maybe catch up with some of the people who are brighter than me mm. do, 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 yeah, do, do yeah. you mean I think it's a good line yeah yeah absolutely no it's great advice and any bad advice that you've been given um yeah, maybe my, my father saying, whatever you do, don't open up a travel agency, for goodness sake, stick to being a welder. Sorry, Dad. Yeah, uh, yeah, but no, it's a good one, because if you hadn't made that move, your life would be very different, wouldn't it? Yeah, what it yeah is you, today, you, 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 know? you don't know, do you? It's like many things, you don't know which way your life would have gone, and it's like, yeah. sometimes is it fate, you know, that it's you're directing one path or one path, I don't know. I think I've always tried, I've always tried to treat people like, I would like to be treated. Mm. I've never really tried to talk down to people. Obviously, during this, some people I'd be offended and they ask for things. I've said, no, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. But I've always tried to treat people like I am. I try and go around my city um, quite discreetly. I do drive a nice car, um, but I, I tend to, you know, I'll go to Sainsbury's and do the shop and I'll go to Little and do the shop and I'll do whatever. I, I, that's just me. I'm just happy me, really. Yeah, no, you are. Well, one, you're massively inspiring. Two, you're very humble. Um, and, and three, I just think in terms of the potential of what, what anyone can do with the right mindset, there's a lot of lessons in what you've, you know, what you've kind of shared today. I think that's really fantastic. Okay. Thank so, you. Thank you ever so much, Martin. Thank you. Brilliant. Okay. Bye.